optomechanics is, is sort of a, a growing uh, area of research among, among physicists, in, in part uh, fueled by gravitational wave detectors, but also to, to a, a great extent fueled by uh, other topics such as quantum information science. So let's describe what cavity optomechanics is. Let's start with cavity. In this case, the cavity being referred to is not the cavities we have uh, when we eat too many sweets and, and make holes in our teeth, but these are optical cavities. So what they are, are it's a, a tumor, usually an optical cavity is a two mirror system. You can have cavities with three or four or multiple mirrors, but the minimum is two. And the idea here is that if you have two mirrors uh, facing each other, you can bounce light between them. The very same way as if you put your own face between two mirrors and you see multiple reflections, you can face two mirrors towards each other, inject some light in, in them, and the light will bounce multiple times before coming back out. And that uh, the number of times the light bounces in a cavity uh, is determined by the reflectivity of the mirrors. Obviously, if you had uh, uh, cavities made of 100% reflective mirrors, you could never get any light in and you could never get any light out. So typically the cavities we work with have some, some have, a, have very high reflectivity but not perfectly 100% to get many, many bounces. So that's the cavity piece. Now the optomechanics piece of this is if you could take one of the mirrors of, the, of this cavity and make it a movable mirror. So in the case of LIGO, that comes very naturally because the LIGO mirrors are suspended as pendulums, so they're free to move above the resonant frequency of the pendulum. In many, many other research groups where these, where, where, that are pursuing these ideas of cavity optomechanics, the mirror may be a little nanomechanical structure, a little flexure that can, can is free to vibrate, and those have, you know, those have resonant frequencies around gigahertz. So, and there is a whole range of experiments in this field where you know, the LIGO mirrors are the biggest and slowest. They're kilograms in mass and hertz resonators down to sort of picogram mass gigahertz resonators uh, in the nanomechanical world. And the, th the thing that unites all of these experiments is that in each and every case, we're trying to couple the mechanical motion of the mirror and the light. And the, the purpose of, of doing that are, are also, there are many uh, different reasons to do that. In LIGO, of course, we care because we have a movable mirror, so it responds to the, the, the gravitational wave. But we also have lots and lots of light so that we can make a good measurement, a, 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 a sensitive measurement of the mirror motion. And that gives us a very natural optomechanical coupling. So in our case, this is a necessity of our measurement. Another useful um, application of such an optomechanical system is if you wanted, for example, to take the mechanical motion of the mirror uh, as a coupling method for coupling, uh, say, light of very, very different wavelengths. So you could imagine that you have a mechanical oscillator that couples very strongly to an optical field. You can then imprint on the mirror motion the, some quantum s information that you like. You turn off your optical field, and in, on the other side or the same side, you turn on a microwave field. And there are certain ways in which you can do, you know, you can transfer optical information to the microwave and back using the motion of these mechanical oscillators. So in our own labs, we use cavity optomechanics to try to understand the problem that LIGO faces, which is this problem of the momentum transfer of light to the mirror causing, the, the, the causing mirror motion, and we want to find ways to make that as small as possible. So this is called the quantum radiation pressure noise problem. And what it is, is that in the in LIGO interferometers, the vacuum fluctuations that enter the, the open port of the interferometers interfere with the, the strong laser fields that are, are incident on the mirrors. And those vacuum fluctuations cause fluctuating motions uh, of the mirrors because of the radiation pressure. So a very 
an interesting way to think about this is that when advanced LIGO is built and we are limited truly by these quantum radiation pressure fluctuations, we have a mirror that's so, so still and so shielded from all external forces that its motion is limited by the vacuum fluctuations. Quantum mechanics is always bizarre, and these ideas are always, you know, uh, make it sound even more bizarre, which it is. So we are trying to do experiments where we can couple the light very, very strongly to these movable mirrors and create a system where the motion of the mirror is limited by nothing else but this, this uh, uh, quantum radiation pressure. And once you do that, you can start to do interesting experiments uh, to reduce this quantum radiation pressure noise. Uh, you can't really do that by changing the couplings necessarily to the mirrors, but you can do that by, for example, uh, coupling uh, different quantum states of light to the mirror. So the ordinary vacuum fluctuations uh, will cause the mirror to move by a certain amount. If you could then uh, inject into such a system a squeezed state of, of light where the fluctuations are very are made very large in the phase direction but were small in the amplitude direction you could reduce that motion so these are the ideas we're chasing in the cavity optomechanics experiments there's another very interesting application that uh, that that we are uh, uh, hoping to observe and that is um, to actually use this optomechanical coupling to make a squeezed state of light so a squeezed state of light again is a a, a state of, of light where you can actually make the uh, noise or the uncertainty in, in one variable, for example, the amplitude variable small, at the same time making the uncertainty in the conjugate variable, which is phase, larger, so that that product is, is still preserved. The product must be preserved to not violate Heisenberg. So how can we now use the optomechanical coupling to do that? Well, here is the idea. To, to make this, this kind of amplitude noise small, phase noise large, or vice versa system, the thing you need is you need to correlate the amplitude and the phase fluctuations. Imagine you have a mirror, and you have some laser light that, that I I hits the mirror. Now, this laser light has amplitude fluctuations, and those amplitude fluctuations uh, cause the mirror to move because of the ra fluctuating radiation pressure. When the mirror moves, its position changes, and the light that's reflected, the phase of that light now picks up the information about the motion of the mirror. So the motion of the mirror is moving due to amplitude fluctuations. It then impresses those amplitude fluctuations on the phase of the light, and you've correlated amplitude and phase. And so you can use this optomechanical coupling to also make um, squeezed um, states of, of light. And that's another uh, area that we are uh, pursuing very actively, and it has some advantages compared to other ways of making uh, squeezed states of light. Cavity optomechanics is an extremely rich area of research being pursued actually in, in many parts of the world now on many, many scales from, th from the uh, picogram gigahertz scales to the kilogram hertz scales, all with the, the you know, this range of goals to do with making interesting quantum states of these mechanical oscillators and using those as tools of quantum information science or for making better gravitational wave detectors. One of the biggest challenges in, in, in these optomechanic, cavity optomechanics systems is that you have to make a mechanical oscillator whose motion is dominated by the interaction with the light. And turns out there's another fundamental demon of physics that gets in the way, and that is thermal noise. As you know, every mechanical degree of freedom, you know, physics tells, thermodynamics tells us, every mechanical degree of freedom has kT of energy, where k is the Boltzmann constant and t is temperature. So whenever you have an oscillator at some finite temperature, it has motion that is due to those thermally driven fluctuations. And if you look at sort of the greatest challenges to these cavity optomechanics experiments, 
it largely lies in how to get to the optomechanical couplings to dominate over these thermally driven fluctuations of the mirrors. And that's actually, an, but it's, it's certainly an experimental challenge, but it's also a rather uh, intriguing and important theoretical challenge because it is not, it, it's a very active and, o and, and, and vibrant area of research to try to understand how these thermally driven fluctu, you know, what processes give rise to these thermal uh, fluctuations and, and how can we go about uh, reducing them. So those are, I think that's sort of the, one of the biggest challenges and many cavity optomechanics experiments are at the moment done in, in extreme refrigeration environments. So they're either done in, in, cry, in cryostats or dilution refrigerators just so to cool the mechanical degree of freedom uh, enough that its thermally driven motion doesn't dominate. And I think as we move more towards practical applications of, of these, these systems, we'll have to learn how not to need such extreme, you know, refrigeration and to be able to work in more, more ordinary laboratory environments. If we can develop these cavity optomechanics I ideas to, to the point where they, are, they become cheap and easy, uh, I, s I expect that these will be important uh, building blocks of uh, quantum information science or important building blocks of information transfer. We know very well how to encode interesting quantum information on light, but then what we can now transfer that quantum information through the motion of a mechanical oscillator to some other carrier, whether it's, it's, it's a microwave field or it's some sort of capacitive sensor or something else. So I think the, the, the technological applications are, are very many. Uh, we are still in the infancy of seeing them show up in, in our computers or our cell phones. <laughs>